it's wonderful to be here at UWA. Uh, and I must say as well, uh, we certainly feel the great loss of David Plowman, who was a friend and a colleague, uh, and an inspiration to generations of students and also uh, to academics like myself and Alison and probably others in this room. Um, and so uh, it's with his memory in mind that uh, we proceed to a discussion of productivity, which is something that uh, David also addressed and I'm sure many in this room um, address in uh, various ways, um, in particular to try to understand and unravel uh, such an unruly concept. Uh, it's certainly one that has vexed economists for many years uh, and uh, being such an area of contention it's not surprising that it becomes um, such a, a slippery concept in public debate as well with uh, mythology around it. Uh, I must say I was amazed to read the other day a statement by the head of one of our major public agencies in Australia who suggested um, that uh, productivity could uh, be increased only if uh, public servants worked more hours per week. Um, how this was meant to increase the amount of output or quality of the product per hour remains anyone's guess, but this was put forward as a serious proposition. I think the only thing on which everyone would be agreed uh, is Paul Krugman's statement that uh, productivity may not be everything, but it's almost everything. And uh, we'll see why uh, today uh, when we look at uh, some of the work that we've been doing in this area over the last few years. Um, so let's start with this one, uh, which is um, to represent a book that was published a few years ago by Tom Friedman called The World is Flat. Some of you may have read it. It portrayed an interconnected world uh, through ICT uh, and with uh, barriers falling uh, and mobility of people and capital across borders in which everyone could be competitive and successful. Uh, but of course, uh, not everyone can be successful in such a world and uh, Richard Florida wrote a response in the Atlantic uh, which was headed, uh, no, the world is spiky. And it's spiky because there are spikes of uh, higher productivity and competitive advantage in different parts of the world. Uh, driven by such factors as knowledge and ingenuity. Uh, and uh, this is the world in which we live. Uh, it's one where productivity is very important to all of us uh, because it is a source of our existing or potential competitive advantage. Why is it so important? Uh, we see from here, from this slide, um, exactly why. Let's have a look at it for a few moments because um, it's frightening in a number of respects, partly because it's a bit complicated, but also uh, because of what it portrays. It's a slide that was produced by David Gruen of the Treasury a few years ago. It was reproduced uh, the other day in the BCA's statement, and it summarises the dilemma that we face in Australia. I'll, I'll use this one here, uh, whereby uh, the major contribution to our national income growth in the 1990s was indeed our productivity performance. Um, if you think about it, uh, the three P's so-called, uh, these are the drivers of our national income growth, population, labour participation and productivity. Uh, productivity was the major driver uh, indeed over the um, period since the Second World War of our economic growth and in our growth in national income. But something happened in the 2000s, uh, we saw behind the windfall gains from the commodity boom, um, a structural deterioration in our productivity performance. But we didn't notice it because the green section replaced the absent productivity growth and the green section is the contribution to <coughs> national income growth by the terms of trade, which in turn are uh, driven by our commodity prices. Um, our commodity prices, um, in the case of iron ore, quadrupled 
without us having to do a thing. We were still exporting the same amount of iron ore and coal. It's just that our partners and, uh, 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 and uh, importers were prepared to pay more for it. Um, it's sometimes called the gift from China. And it added 15% to our national in income over a six year period. It was the first phase of the mining boom. The other two phases which we're becoming familiar with are the investment boom and construction of new mining uh, facilities and the third phase is uh, increased production. But that production is taking place with diminishing returns, uh, certainly not the prices that were set uh, when uh, the uh, boom was at its height. We've passed the end of the commodity price boom and that means that here with the terms of trade going into reverse, the challenge is not just to increase our productivity growth to the long term average, but beyond it to something like 3%. We've seen a bounce back of productivity, of labour productivity uh, in the last 18 months to two years, but it certainly is not sufficient to make up for that decline in uh, the contributions to our national income growth. And that's the dilemma facing the Australian economy. There's no getting away from uh, these statistics. Um, but where there is a, a debate yet to be had is what are the new sources of growth in productivity and output that can be generated to uh, make up the gap. This is something we addressed in a report that was published a year or so ago uh, by the McKell Institute. We wanted to understand uh, what are the sources of productivity in the Australian economy, drawing on evidence, um, hopefully uh, <coughs> addressing some myths as we went, and um, how were we to do this in what has become a high cost economy. We are a high cost economy now um, and that requires as we move up the value chain um, a high productivity uh, outcome uh, in terms of our future competitive advantage. Um, and if we want to drill down a little bit further into where we stand with our productivity performance, uh, let's look at this which is the 1990s, the red column is Australia, the blue OECD. Uh, we were tracking ahead of the OECD in terms of our labour productivity, that's um, output per hour, and uh, it was a period that was driven by microeconomic reform, opening up of markets, technological change, and there are still debates about this. It's a hotly contested issue as to what were the sources of productivity growth during this period. There's no doubt that productivity performance was uh, at an historical high, but was it uh, the opening up of markets or uh, technology or other factors? Um, even now there is debate about um, where uh, technology will make a, uh, an impact. Um, you may have seen the new book, The Second Mach Machine Age uh, by Bryn Johnson and uh, McAfee, um, but again, arguing for the uh, impact of technology on productivity and employment in the United States, uh, but against uh, those arguments are those of uh, Bob Gordon at Northwestern University who suggests that the technology boom has now run out of steam and will not lead to the job creation that previous booms have done. Um, but in, what, if, if the uh, uh, productivity performance of the 1990s uh, is uncontested. Well, the 2000s are also very obvious. Uh, as you can see, Australia's productivity performance has now uh, dropped way behind the rest of the OECD, and this is now reflected in our growth in unit labour costs. Um, Australia's unit labour cost growth in recent years has been way ahead of the average of other advanced countries, and uh, this is not because uh, we have an inflation boom. Uh, inflation is pretty comparable with the rest of the world. It's because of our lagging productivity growth. And it gets worse when we look at multi-factor productivity. Labour productivity is the productivity of the workforce. Um, 
uh, as measured in uh, an ABS context, but multi-factor productivity takes into account other inputs. Uh, it's the uh, broadest definition of productivity taking into account the role of capital. And here what we find is that uh, not only have we not grown, but we've actually gone backwards in Australia. Some of this is due to uh, temporary and specific factors, and this is where the myth-busting has to occur, because 80% um, of this uh, uh, fall is due to three things. One is that uh, the investment in mining has not paid off as yet in production, so we will see some bounce back in productivity there. Um, also, the cost uh, reductions in the public utilities sector in the 1990s has now been overcompensated by investment, especially in electricity production, and uh, this has led to the so-called gold plating of our electricity assets. Again, a drag on productivity, and finally, uh, the effect of drought. But um, these are temporary effects, um, and we can make up for those, and we are making up for those now. But it still leaves a proportion of productivity decline that is accounted for by other sectors of the economy, including manufacturing, uh, which is um, our most trade-exposed sector and where competitive advantage really matters. Um, and it matters in this context as well, which is the portrayal of our um, international competitiveness as uh, in particular driven by changes in the exchange rate. And uh, as the graph goes up, it means a drop in competitiveness by comparison with uh, the US and the Euro area. Um, in other words, what we have is now a double challenge for trade exposed industries in Australia, particularly manufacturing. Um, the first challenge is to increase productivity beyond where uh, it was in the 1990s in order to make up for the fall in the terms of trade. That would have happened automatically in the 1980s because the terms of trade fell, um, the dollar fell when the terms of trade fell. Uh, in other words, uh, with a depreciating dollar, our manufacturing industry automatically became more competitive. That's not happening in this um, phase. It's not happening because uh, the Australian dollar is a safe haven currency. Uh, we've got huge investment uh, in the dollar from the Swiss and the Russian central banks uh, and others, and that's maintaining the value of the dollar, making it uh, even more difficult for trade-exposed sectors to achieve uh, competitiveness levels that enable them to survive. And they're not surviving. Um, this report by the Prime Minister's Manufacturing Task Force, which I was um, pleased to be part of because it provided a great insight into what was happening at the time uh, in the manufacturing sector. This was a response to the loss of um, over 100,000 jobs in that sector over a period of 18 months. Um, there are about um, 800,000 jobs now in the manufacturing sector, not too dissimilar from the 1960s, but output very greatly increased, of course. Uh, it is still a very important sector to the Australian economy, and it's particularly important because it's so uh, trade exposed. Um, it's also important because uh, it contributes a quarter of our R&D uh, across the country. Uh, it contributes uh, high wage, high productivity skills, not just within the narrowly defined manufacturing sector, but across uh, construction, across uh, telecommunications, and in the mining sector. A lot of the uh, changes and research and productivity improvements in the mining sector stem from uh, changes in the manufacturing sector, um, and it results uh, as well in an ecosystem of um, skill formation around uh, computer science, engineering, and all the related services to manufacturing. But most importantly of all, uh, manufacturing contributes to our trade balance. Um, if you uh, want to maintain a first world um, set of living standards in Australia, as we all do, uh, we cannot do so with a third world 
economic structure. We cannot uh, simply uh, switch the economy to the export of unprocessed raw materials because we simply will not be able to pay for the huge appetite that we have for imported consumer goods. Uh, we do need other sources of growth and productivity to afford the goods that we buy to maintain our living standards and manufacturing is an important part of that. Services are as well but they're not as trade exposed except in the case of tourism and education. Can we do it in Australia? Can we develop um, a manufacturing sector that uh, will be competitive in a very rapidly changing world economy um, or are we too late? If we compare Scandinavia, which has a population not dissimilar from Australia of about 23 million, um, with uh, Australia we find that the Scandinavian countries have five uh, large global um, manufacturing companies in the Fortune Top 500. Uh, we have zero. Um, we have uh, the mining companies, of course, a bank, um, a retailer. Um, does that matter? Um, in the past it might have done in the era of uh, large-scale mass production manufacturing. In the future it won't matter as much um, and this is very fortuitous for Australia provided we can take advantage of this opportunity. Um, the future of manufacturing belongs to uh, smaller units of production, uh, globalised units of production, companies that we're increasingly describing as micro-multinationals, uh, companies that export most of their product into global markets and value chains. And we have many such companies in Australia, surprisingly enough. Uh, they operate below the radar. Uh, they're very effective companies. Um, they're uh, at least comparable with similar companies in the German Mittelstand, uh, companies like uh, Rode Microphones in Sydney. Uh, there was a company that was uh, producing 600 microphones for the local Sydney market. It now produces 60,000 microphones a month for the world, world market. It's uh, one of the mar world market leaders. Uh, Ferrer Engineering in uh, Queensland, which is Boeing's global supplier of the year for the Dreamliner. Um, Morand in, in Melbourne, which has switched from car components to aerospace. Uh, Precision Engineering in Adelaide, which uh, produces uh, car components for Chrysler. It's understood that in the post-car assembly world, the car components sector um, has to reposition, diversify, become involved in global value chains as well as local ones. Um, and here in uh, Perth, uh, you have many such companies as well. Uh, Hoffman Engineering being a very good example, uh, selling mining equipment around the world, including to Peru and Chile. Um, these are companies that are the future of Australia's manufacturing sector. Um, they're not very well known, if at all. Uh, there are probably around 1,500 of them, according to some research that we're conducting at the moment for the Manufacturing Excellence Task Force. Um, these are, are companies which um, need some uh, government support, not in the form of subsidies or subsidies for business as usual, but in terms of uh, infrastructure and the enabling conditions that are required by companies to cluster, to build critical mass, to access international markets. I'll come back to that, but maybe refer to a, an interesting example of how this can happen even in a remote part of Germany uh, in their Mittelstand area uh, around southern Germany, uh, where I was uh, a few months ago, uh, in a little town that most Germans haven't even heard of called Schweningen. Uh, we have a partner university there. And uh, this was the area of Germany that was the former clock-making area of Germany in the 17th and 18th centuries. It no longer makes clocks, it makes surgical instruments. And it makes the best surgical instruments in the world. And it does so with very little infrastructure, uh, no autobahn, no airport, uh, just small companies uh, operating out of uh, small towns and villages uh, together with the university uh, where the managers teach in the classes the students take internships in the companies. The Fraunhofer Institute, very well funded, uh, government funding, underpins the sector with technology foresights. Where is the surgical instrument market going to be in the year 2030? They know and they'll be 
uh, at um, literally the cutting edge of that market. Uh, it, it's um, a different way of approaching uh, innovation and productivity. It's about the creation of innovation ecosystems, but it requires investment in our knowledge base. And uh, the Australia in the Asian Century report uh, is an attempt to indicate where we can position ourselves in the Asian Century. Um, certainly raw materials is going to be part of that story, but so is knowledge-based manufacturing and services uh, in manufacturing, in professional services, in construction, in architecture, in design. Um, it requires uh, knowledge and skills to drive productivity in that context. But where are we placed in the knowledge stakes? Um, this is a measure which the OECD has devised, uh, which measures investment in knowledge in three areas as a composite index. One is investment in higher education as a proportion of GDP. Uh, the second is in um, R&D as a proportion of GDP. And the third is in ICT as a measure of technological proficiency. And uh, we not only lag the Scandinavian countries, uh, we also lag countries much more like us, uh, Canada, a resource producer, um, as a measure of the investment that we make um, in our knowledge and skills as a country. Um, and this was of great concern um, uh, a few years ago in 2008 when the uh, National Innovation Systems Review was established led by Terry Cutler. Uh, that was a review to analyze what were the ingredients of a successful national innovation system internationally and how would we do it in Australia if we really uh, invested. And it found that we're, <coughs> a lot of recommendations, but there were really two standout observations from this review. Uh, the first one was we don't actually have a national innovation system. We have a lot of ad hoc policies, but nothing systemic, nothing which joins the dots, the key elements of a national innovation system as you might find it in Scandinavia or Germany or even increasingly the US, a relationship between government, finance, research and education, and the level of the enterprise, which is where uh, innovation and productivity ultimately has to happen, where it gets traction. Uh, we don't have such a system, um, either nationally or even locally. We have a lot of successful individual enterprises uh, and, some e and even some successful policy interventions, but nothing on a systemic basis. And the other observation was, and this is where we get to our discussion of the role of management at the level of the enterprise. When we talk about innovation, we're not just talking about science and technology. And this is a big hurdle for a lot of um, policy makers to jump because the whole traditional emphasis of innovation policy in Australia, research and technology policy has been on funding science and technology, public research, uh, not on what's happening within our organisations, where two-thirds of innovation spending by companies, according to the ABS, is in non-technological forms of innovation. Non-technological. In other words, new business models. Um, look at Apple. Look at companies that have transformed themselves uh, through business model redesign as opposed to simply new technology. There's nothing particularly wonderful about iPhone technology, but the business model is brilliant. Uh, the uh, role of systems integration, which in fact Australian firms are quite good at, uh, design, uh, and in particular high performance work and management practices. Um, how do we renovate those in our organisations? And how do we do so in a way that connects with other parts of the innovation system, in particular um, universities and research institutions. Now, just uh, run this one past you because what it shows, and this is a, a survey of 5,000 leading companies in the UK and the US a few years ago, and what it shows is that when companies are sourcing innovation in universities, they are less interested 
in technology licensing than in what they call in this survey informal contacts. No one expected the outcome to be like this uh, from the survey. Everyone expected companies to say universities should be more like us, more commercially minded, but they were not saying that. They were saying universities need to be more like universities as we understand them, sources of inquiry, of critical thinking, of uh, people who can help us cross the disciplinary boundaries uh, and interact with people in our companies on journeys of discovery. Uh, it doesn't have to happen in a lab, it can happen in a cafe, it can happen in a conference or a workshop, uh, it can happen in ongoing relationships, but this is the way innovation ecosystems are defined in many parts of the world. And uh, this is what uh, the Powering Ideas uh, white paper was attempting to do. It was Kim Carr's 10-year plan for um, reinvigorating Australia's national innovation system. Uh, well, he only got a couple of years to do it. Uh, and we hope that we will see something from the current government that takes uh, the discussion forward. There will be an innovation or a, an industry competitiveness white paper coming out in a few months' time. So we're promised we'll see what happens. But the point about this white paper was that it was the first to take the focus away simply from public research to the workplace, to the enterprise, to understand what systemic change needs to take place uh, to enable our enterprises to achieve higher productivity through the role of management. We haven't really had this discussion since the Carpen Review of 1995. Uh, some of you may be old enough to remember what happened to that report. Uh, it was one that was commissioned under a gov la previous Labor government in the 1990s. Uh, it uh, produced a, a review, very well researched, demonstrating that Australian management lagged um, international comparators and uh, required um, some policy interventions uh, to, to improve the level and quality of management. Um, unfortunately, um, the, once government changed in 1996, the coalition of uh, businesses, unions, policy makers, universities around that report dissolved and it went away for a few years. But it came back again uh, in the 2000s uh, with the deterioration of our productivity performance and uh, we refocused, uh, especially in this paper, on what would be required to improve the quality of our management. But we had no data on our management quality. If we're going to improve it, what is the benchmark? What are we improving it from and where to? Uh, and that's when the government decided to fund a study that uh, had been started by the London School of Economics, uh, together with McKinsey and Stanford University, of management calibre and quality in 15 countries. Uh, Australia was not included in that international study. Uh, it was very well structured uh, using a unique methodology, uh, which I can certainly come back to later, but it was one that would drill down very successfully into the quality of Australian managers if only uh, we would be part of the study. Uh, and uh, the government decided to buy our way in. LSE weren't going to do it, Australia was too far away and they weren't particularly interested. Uh, but once the government put the money behind the study, um, we were able to become part of what was then uh, a 16 country comparative um, international survey. And um, this is a study that uh, we undertook at uh, UTS a number, with a number of other uh, universities uh, and the Society for Knowledge Economics. And, um, what we found as the, uh, certainly the, the fundamental uh, point of the findings was that um, management practice is closely related to productivity performance. Um, and we were able to measure this uh, and we were able to demonstrate this statistically on the basis of a, of a survey um, that used a, a carefully designed scoring grid um, of 18 management characteristics in three categories 
uh, with uh, 500 companies uh, to contribute to the 6,000 observations that had taken place in uh, all the countries studied around the world. Uh, the fundamental finding was, yes, management practice is closely related to productivity performance, and so where did we position ourselves uh, in terms of that productivity performance? Um, there were uh, averages and also some disaggregation. Let's start with ab averages, and uh, where we find ourselves is not at the bottom of the list. That's uh, something to be thankful for. Uh, we're not the worst performer when it comes to management performance on a scoring grid of five. Uh, but nor are we among the top tier, and we really can't afford not to be. Um, when the study was finalised and the minister at the time, Minister Carr, um, wanted to launch it at a, an event like this, he said, well, where am I going to get a headline out of being average? Uh, this is not very good for a politician. Uh, well, the headline is, we can't afford to be average. Uh, we're a high-cost economy. Um, if we're going to compete effectively up the value chain, uh, we cannot afford to have average management practice scores. Uh, we have to improve. But note those at the top, the US and Sweden. Uh, for those who think industrial relations systems make all the difference, um, this is uh, fairly sobering news because you couldn't find two systems that would be more different than those of the US and Sweden. And yet the emphasis that they put into the quality of their management uh, is the defining characteristic of their performance. And uh, that is broken down into all the different elements of management performance in this study. When we do uh, drill down, we find that better management is associated with a number of key factors. And the three that are the standout are firstly that uh, better management is associated with being a large globalised company. Well, that stands to reason because large companies tend to have uh, more qualified management, more uh, uh, standardised practices, uh, better recruitment and promotion policies, um, and this tends to uniformity across all the individual countries. Um, it's really at the other end of uh, the size factor that the real differentiation occurs, and that is among SMEs. And when we look at SMEs in Australia, we find that we have um, a long tail of mediocrity uh, compared with other countries. This is the real differentiator. Big companies are much the same across all the countries participating in the survey, but uh, the differentiator is the quality of management in SMEs. And of course we do have some uh, very competitive SMEs in Australia of the kind that I mentioned previously, the micro multinationals, uh, but um, statistically we, we don't across the sector. Um, so looking at our smaller companies is really essential if we are to uh, improve our productivity performance as a country. Secondly, uh, having management uh, decision-making autonomy is a factor, uh, not a very large one, but it is a factor in better management performance. Uh, but the one that was the, the biggest, had the biggest impact was the uh, level of qualifications of the managers. Um, and in Australia, we have one of the smallest proportions of managers with tertiary qualifications of any kind, whether a business school or engineering or uh, science or arts and humanities. Um, it doesn't always matter. We have instinctive leaders and managers who don't require uh, too much formal education, but um, nevertheless, statistically, it does make a difference uh, to have that, those levels of skills. And uh, in many of our SMEs, those are lacking. Um, so the conclusion that the LSE study drew, and this is right across all of the uh, countries around the world, was that uh, governments do have a part in this. Um, if management 
practice and behaviour is a key factor in productivity performance, why are we not, as governments and policy makers, paying more attention to it? Um, it is an essential and effective way to increase the performance of our economies. Um, and the, what the uh, survey showed was that uh, by even having a, a one uh, unit increase in the management score, it was the equivalent of a, an almost a 45% uh, increase in capital investment or a 60% increase in investment in the workforce. Uh, very expensive to do it that way. Uh, how much more cost effective to focus on the quality of our management? Drilling down further, uh, we had, uh, as I said before, 18 characteristics of management. I don't name them on this graph, but we categorise them as operations, management, performance and people. And uh, what we see there in the blue columns is Australia's management practice scores compared with the red columns, which are global best practice. And we can see that in operations and performance, yes, we lag global best practice, but not awfully. Uh, we're behind, but it isn't hugely significant. Uh, but look at uh, people management. Here we're really seriously lagging and most particularly in this one area. This is uh, instilling a talent mindset. Uh, it's the area in which Australian managers lag most behind global best practice. What is instilling a talent mindset? It's about how managers engage with talent and creativity in their workplaces. How do you engage with talent? Um, there are a number of factors in the people management score, rewarding good performance, uh, penalising poor performance. Um, we lag in those areas as well, but this is the area in which we see the biggest gap. And it's one that we can address. It's within our power to address it. Uh, and I'm sure those of you in this audience who have a role as managers or uh, as uh, policy makers or practitioners within the employment relations uh, human resources space, uh, know yourselves how important it is uh, to get the people management equation right um, in organisations. Without it, uh, technology, uh, structural change, um, um, lean systems um, mean very little. Yes. Okay. Uh, this is one of the 18 categories of management that we measured. Um, each of the categories of um, management behaviour had a title. And this one, instilling a talent mindset, has a whole series of questions behind it that are put to the senior managers of organisations when they are asked as to uh, the performance of management in those organisations. Um, and they are about how they engage uh, talent in the workplace, in the decision making and uh, production uh, processes of their organisation. And remember, these are all, I should have said at the beginning, um, all manufacturing companies. Uh, this is a survey, I'll come to a survey in a moment which looks at services very briefly, but this is a survey about manufacturing and it's about how managers make use of people uh, in their workplaces. We constantly see surveys in Australia on skills utilisation and managers are complaining that they can make use of only 50% of the skills of the people who work for them on the shop floor. Well, what an indictment that is. Uh, while certainly some areas of skill may not be relevant to uh, the, the operations of a workplace, uh, most of them are or can be um, transitioned into those that are. And uh, making use of those skills is the role of management. 
how to structure their relationships with the workforce. Uh, and that's what this talent mindset is about. Um, it's about making sure that those skills are deployed to the most effective uh, goal that we can identify, how to optimise uh, the use of, a, of, of those skills. And it's um, something that, uh, again, the Australia in the Asian Century white paper drew our attention to because what that report also indicated was that if we are to differentiate ourselves and develop competitive advantage in those industries uh, that uh, are based on knowledge uh, in the Asia-Pacific context in particular, then we need to uh, develop creativity and design-based thinking to do so. Uh, we need to maximise the application of creativity. Um, what uh, Robert Reich pointed out in his book on the labour market of the future in the 1990s is now being realised. Uh, what he argued was that in the future it uh, didn't matter so much that you were a graduate of a university because graduates were going to be divided up. They were going to be divided up between those whose skills could be commoditized and offshored or automated or sold at low cost, uh, all effectively the same thing, uh, and those skills that were unique, that offered unique capabilities that uh, uh, required interpretation, which uh, required creativity. And uh, those skills he called the skills of the symbolic analysts. The symbolic analysts will be those that are awarded in the international marketplace. Those whose skills that can be commoditized are going to be marginalized, offshored, automated. Uh, and uh, will certainly not reap the rewards irrespective of uh, a graduate degree. It's, um, it's uh, pretty challenging news for new generations of uh, graduates coming through our universities uh, because we know that some of the skills that people are emerging with from universities are not going to be with us for very long. Think of audit. Um, a lot of this is already being offshored. Uh, we have people, I know them, working in our consulting firms whose sole job is to advise other companies on how to outsource their activities, whether back office or even front office activities. It means, and this is another discussion to have, that we need to change the way we do a lot of our education in universities to ensure that people have these kind of skills and not the skills that can easily be uh, offshored. It means that uh, we have to do a lot more of this. Uh, this is a study that was undertaken by uh, one of our colleagues at UTS uh, for the government and the CSIRO on um, the role of design thinking, not just design of products, but how we visualize our markets, um, how, we, uh, how we develop the customer experience, how we capture value from global value chains, which is not just about the production component of a product, but also the design, uh, the engineering, uh, and the customer end, uh, from which as much value, if not more, can be extracted than from production. Again, the Apple iPhone is a classic example, pr production offshored, but uh, value captured by the, the, the the domestic firm uh, back in California uh, through the design end at one end and the customer experience at the other. Um, this was a, a study of um, a number of the companies that I mentioned earlier, the micro multinationals who have made that successful transition, who are part of global <coughs> value chains and are uh, highly competitive and uh, making a difference um, in international markets. In the services sector as well, um, this is a study that was undertaken by the Society for Knowledge Economics um, a couple of years ago. High performance organisations were found to be more productive, more profitable, more innovative and better, had better employee experiences. And here this 
uh, survey also um, identified and um, quantified the link with fairness in the workplace. Um, we hear a lot about increasing inequality, uh, especially in the OECD countries, in the US. Uh, Joe Stiglitz was out here recently talking about his book um, showing the relationship between inequality and economic performance. Uh, people have often put them in separate boxes in the past, especially in economics, but Joe Stiglitz uh, drew them together and uh, showed uh, the extent to which uh, greater equality contributes to um, economic performance. And this happens also at the level of the firm and the enterprise, um, that uh, high performance organizations are also those that operate fair systems of remuneration and fair, fair treatment um, at the workplace. So where does that leave us? And this is my final uh, set of points in terms of public policy. Um, what I've tried to show is that uh, we have a clear set of arguments from uh, the identification of the problem, which is that we need new sources of productivity and growth in Australia if we're going to maintain our living standards, uh, through to the design of an innovation ecosystem, design of a national and uh, perhaps local innovation systems, uh, the role of management in uh, contributing to the uh, innovation outcomes that we need uh, and indeed raising the quality of management uh, so that they can contribute and enable their employees to contribute to um, the productivity performance of their organisations which in aggregate uh, mean an improvement in the economic performance of the country uh, through to uh, these public policy uh, propositions uh, which, which really link the employment relations function to the broader function uh, of uh, economic policy and productivity improvement um, in the economy as a whole. Uh, employment relations is not something separate. People management is not something separate. It's something that is absolutely integral uh, to the development of both innovation and management capability within our organisations. And so the first um, area of interest, I think, from public policy is to understand, in fact, where are our areas of existing and potential competitive advantage. Most countries conduct what they call a technology or knowledge foresight. Uh, we don't do that in Australia. Um, there is a sense that you get from the Productivity Commission and the central agencies that the market will provide the answer, but it doesn't do so automatically. Uh, the assumption that we operate in a fully employed economy and uh, if one sector declines then another will take its place uh, has been shown over many years not to have much validity uh, and indeed uh, some of those sectors that are in decline have uh, areas of potential competitive advantage that can be grown, manufacturing being the obvious case. We're not going to see any more car assembly in Australia uh, but in the wake of car assembly, there's a much bigger and more important sector, the car component sector. And we have to ask ourselves, well, of course, um, maybe putting uh, so much of uh, our taxpayers' money into car assembly was, was not a, a great idea in retrospect, uh, especially over the last 10 years um, after the transition from high tariffs. Um, maybe it would have been uh, smarter rather than uh, pumping money into the car industry at one end and, uh, and then having government buy fleet purchases of those cars at the other, making the car industry a kind of branch of the public service, uh, it would have been better to uh, put our energy into the development of a highly competitive car component sector where we have uh, some great companies um, and uh, which are part of BMW's supply chain, part of Chrysler's, part of Toyota's, um, and maybe it would have been better to be uh, the world's best supplier of rear vision mirrors uh, and be good at that rather than something that we turned out not to be so good at. But that is what a technology foresight is about. Had we done one 10 years ago, we might not be where we are now. We might be doing things a bit differently. We certainly did something like that with medical technology and that required 
a lot of government interest and action, and we now have uh, some extraordinary world-beating firms in that area, Cochlear and ResMed and others being examples. Um, supporting SME participation in global markets, value chains, this is the role of those micro-multinationals I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's absolutely key uh, that we focus on them because uh, in the manufacturing sector in particular, this is where we can have global competitive advantage. They don't have to be big companies uh, to do so. Um, even if you look at the surgical instrument makers around Schwenningen in Baden-Württemberg in Germany, uh, what was coming out of those villages? Uh, little boxes about this big, but each of those boxes contained surgical instruments worth millions of euro. Um, the tyranny of distance doesn't count in this context. <coughs> we need to invest quite clearly in our knowledge base uh, and in knowledge sharing and engagement. This is the innovation ecosystem uh, that is built around our organisations. Uh, without it, organisations have less chance of becoming globally competitive, less chance of accessing global supply chains. We need also to uh, promote design thinking, uh, not just design as such of our products, but a, way, a new way of thinking about our workplaces. Uh, how do we design the workplace? How do we design our strategies? Uh, how do we design our operations? Uh, how do we design our relationship with our customers? This is the kind of design that Herbert Simon was talking about when he uh, developed the, what he called the science of design, design science, um, several years ago in the 1980s, 90s. Um, it's an important part of innovation. And finally, um, and uh, very importantly, and this really flows from the study uh, that we conducted with LSE uh, around the world, we need to upgrade management capability, especially in those small and medium firms. Uh, if we are to develop successful micro multinationals and if we are to position ourselves competitively, then the quality of management in that SME space is going to be absolutely critical and it means making use of the talent that we do have in the workplace, uh, being confident enough to include uh, the workforce in the decision making process uh, uh, and as part of that commitment to design thinking so that it is a, a shared process uh, to enable us to make up for the gap that we're now beginning to see uh, in the contributions to uh, national income growth with the uh, fall in our terms of trade and the end of the prices phase of the mining boom. So that's the challenge in my view and uh, thank you very much.